Welcome to the final episode focusing on our trustee candidates. We had the opportunity this week to meet with Ed Cannon, former town administrator for Wellington, and ask him some pointed questions. We hope you enjoy the interview. We're going to jump right in with the question that is on everyone's mind. You used to be our town administrator, and now you're running for trustee. There are concerns that you're going to cross the line and act as both an administrator and a trustee. What's your response to that? Well, I believe that as a former town administrator, um, I know better than anyone else why there needs to be a separation between policy and administration. You see, policy is the role of a board of trustees or a city council. Policy is those laws and those ordinances. Uh, it's the vision. It's the direction. It's the, the goal uh, setting uh, uh, of the municipality. And that's the, the role of the legislative branch of that government, which is the Board of Trustees. Um, the board is responsible for identifying that, that goal, shaping that policy. They're identified for putting certain boundaries or restrictions on that. Uh, let's say you want to do X. Well, we want to do X by a certain amount of time. We'd like to keep it within a certain kind of budget. We also want to make sure that that our strategic values and our and our uh, are, are followed and reflected in the outcomes from this. Um, to me, that's policy. That's That says, okay, we're doing this. Here's your boundaries. And at that point, it gets handed over to staff, to the town administrator. And the town administrator at that point has the freedom to marshal staff uh, to achieve that goal as outlined and defined by the, by the Board of Trustees. It's really aggravating when I see uh, trustees uh, trying to cross that line or saying that, that well, you know, we're going to work with staff to do X. That's not the role of a trustee. And quite frankly, if you do that, um, it breeds distrust within the organization. It, it, it lessens the town administrator's uh, role and responsibility because trustees are now stepping past that administrator and, and getting hands-on with the staff. The staff, it creates, it creates uh, distrust and conflict as well because now you've got not your boss, but your boss's boss, a trustee coming in, telling you how to do things, and, and it becomes then a trustee project instead of uh, a staff project. So, no, I will never cross that line. And if I see instances as a trustee of other trustees trying to do that, I'll call attention to that very quick and remind us that our role is for policy and the role for staff is administration. There's been a lot of tension over the last year or so between some on the board of trustees and the town administrator. Do you feel that you'll be able to work well with Ms. Garcia? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, Patty Garcia is a, is a fine administrator and uh, from all aspects, she's doing a, a, a great job in that role. Um, in fact, as a, as a trustee and a member of the board of trustees, I look forward to working with Patty Garcia. In preparing for this interview, we took the time to go through your website, specifically your priorities. One of the items that you listed was growing commercial businesses in Wellington. That's been a need for the town for a while now. What can you bring to the table to really make a difference in promoting growth for our town? You know, I think that's a great question. And, and that's one of the reasons why uh, commercial growth um, is one of my highest priorities as a trustee. Um, you know, I have a long history as a town manager and a town administrator in in two different states of of bringing economic development to a community, even sometimes to a distressed community. So I I know the process. I'm very I was very successful at that. I know the tools that municipalities can use to encourage that kind of growth. But the reason I, I make a priority on this is in Colorado, Colorado municipalities, their number one source of income should be sales tax revenues. But if you look at uh, Wellington's budget, sales taxes just barely outpace property taxes. Meanwhile, a community like Tenmouth, that sales tax is 10, 15 times the amount of uh, property taxes. In 2018, the town did a study uh, with Buxton uh, this is a, uh, an international intelligence, uh, a commercial intelligence organization. And they discovered that of all the Wellington households, about $150 million every year was spent by Wellington residents outside of Wellington. 
Now, $150 million a year, every single year, just for the type of goods and services that we all need every single day. If we had been capturing that 150, then we would be generating 14 and a half million dollars of sales tax revenue every year, which can which can pay for those kind of uh, you know activities or or services to the community. And what's more important is by providing this commercial services, uh, our residents don't have to make a 30 mile round trip to another community just to buy groceries or to buy a, a two by four. Uh, or, or a, a new appliance. Uh, so we need to be able to find a way to get commercial growth to keep up with our residential growth. Because if we don't do that, we may see that as we continue to grow that our property taxes are slowly creeping up while our sales taxes stay stagnant. And after a time, that's unsustainable. So we need to have that commercial growth to keep up with that residential growth. I like the idea of being able to provide jobs for our community. Uh, provide goods and services to our residents who are spending this every day. I like the idea of the town be able to generate sales tax revenue so they can improve things like their streets, uh, parks, um, amenities. Um, we could even be looking at things like a recreation center or major improvements on Highway 20, uh, I-25 and the overpass on Cleveland Avenue. That kind of revenue, it could be a catalyst to help give Wellington a sustainable future going forward. So I, I've i done this before. I know the tools is, that can be used. Uh, we use this Buxton study and we can make some tremendous things happen here in Wellington. One of the big concerns for our show and a lot of residents in Wellington is access to mail-in voting. In October of last year, resolution number 39, 2023 was presented, which was to conduct the April 2024 regular election by mail ballot. That resolution barely passed by a vote of four to three. Where do you stand on mail-in voting for Wellington? Well, in 2018, I was the town administrator and the town had never done mail-in votes. But in 2018, I had included funds in the budget for a mail-in ballot. And it was the first time that Wellington saw this. Um, our voter response increased uh, and it became the same way of, of voting in Wellington as it is pretty much in any other community. I am against any effort to stop mail-in ballots. And I'll tell you why. I grew up in a time period um, in the Deep South during the 1960s, during the Jim Crow era. And I'm very familiar with, with attempts by government to restrict people's civil liberties and, and ability to, to vote. Quite frankly, we need to be doing everything we can to give people the opportunity. Most of our community, most of our community is age 65 and below. Probably about 65, 70% of the community is doing this. These are people with families, with jobs, with obligations, um, you know, and taking time off to drive from wherever they are to come to the Leaper Center, stand in line, cast a ballot. That can cost people money. If people are paid on an hourly basis or if they do contract work, like uh, most of our community is in the construction trades, you know, taking time off takes money out of their pocket. So instead of taking that time to vote, they simply won't vote. And I think there are parties out there that understand that because they want to rely on that biggest voting block, which is the age 65 and above which has the time, the availability, and they tend to vote a little bit more conservatively as well. So, you know, I'm familiar with the type of ploys that that both political parties uh, try to employ. But at the end of the day, for me, it's about providing uh, those civil liberties and civil opportunities uh, so that people can exercise their right to vote. I think it's it's for too far too long, governments have kind of restricted that. Let's stop with the restriction. Let's open the door. Let people vote. All right. One last question, and we saved the best for last. The town is drowning in conspiracies and complaints about Wellington's water rates. Some have suggested that the reason the town's water is so expensive is because Jason Momoa's Aquaman is living in our reservoir. What's your take on the water problem in Wellington? Okay. <laughs> Well, water is a big topic. Um, in fact, when I became the administrator here in 2017, 
I was immediately immersed, so to speak, pardon the pun, uh, immersed in in Wellington's water issues. But the number one water issue in 2017 was the town was trying to find new sources of raw water. So we're not becoming so reliant on the North Poudre contract water. Uh, but today it's a different story. The number one uh, issue with water is people's water utility bills. Um, they are climbing out of out of sight. And quite frankly, uh, all of that is related to a 1983 decision that Wellington leaders made. Wellington in 1983 owned its own water. But in 83, it gave that water, the water rights, to North Poudre in exchange for a contract. And the contract guaranteed a certain amount of water every year, basically for free. That sounded good in 83, but uh, here it is. We are 41 years later. That contract is what's killing everybody because anything above that guaranteed amount, the town has to pay for. And that... And what we pay is based on how much water we use, uh, the price of a North Pooter share, and also the prevailing interest rates on farm loans. Four years ago, we were paying $1.2 million for the R water every year. North Pooter share was about $250,000 per share and our interest rates were low. Well, here we are four years later, North Pooter shares are still the same we're still using roughly the same amount of water, but the interest rates have climbed in recent years because of the Fed, uh, you know, inflating the interest rate to cut, uh, to tackle inflation. That's what's killing you right now. That's your problem with your, with your water bills. And what the town needs to do, and I understand they've already started the process. We need to sit down with North Pooter, open up that contract and renegotiate uh, some of these terms uh, of, of the contract water. The interest rate has nothing to do with how North Pooter delivers the water, neither does the price of the share. It's just a matter of opening some gates and, and flowing the water to the reservoir that we tap into. We need to get those, those variables out of the equation or at least get them manageable so we have more of a, a sustainable uh, cost factor on our water. But the second issue gets back to sourcing new water. Uh, if as we continue to grow, it's going to be harder and harder for North Pooter to provide this, the amount of water to meet our needs because we can't use all of the North Pooter water that they provide. The, the big bulk of that water is, is intended for agricultural purposes. So North Pooter has to go through a system of exchanges to get us the water. But at some point, they're not going to be able to provide the water to Wellington. So we have to find an alternative source. I'd like to be able to reduce our reliance on North Pooter uh, down to a more manageable level, maybe down, back down to that free level again, uh, and then use it utilize uh, a water source that we that we purchase and we bring and we own and we control, and then we can control our destiny. Do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to share with the viewers regarding your run for trustee? So. I, I appreciate that. You know, one of the reasons that I am running for trustee is, is I do have all this training and education and knowledge and experience. I understand Colorado state statutes. I understand Colorado water law. Uh, I have worked in economic development, municipal finance. I know how government works. I've got a master's degree in, in, in that, in that field as well. And I've done that for 13 years. I know what towns can do legally the tools that are available for towns, more than just simply grants, but the type of tools that can help a town succeed. I know just about every mayor and trustee and city council member up and down the front range, as well as the city managers. Uh, I am retired and I will be working full time to promote Wellington as a trustee. Um, if that means you know visiting neighboring communities, talking to legislators down in Denver, then I'm going to be available to do that. Uh, I love this town. My wife and I moved here seven years ago, uh, very involved with community, and we want to see what's best for this town. I see some great opportunity, and I think now is the time with proper leadership that we can get the, we, that we can reach that, that potential. There you have it, Wellington. We're grateful that Ed allowed us to interview him and learn more about his experience and where he stands on a few issues. 
One of the things that we wished we had asked but completely spaced on was budgets. Ed Cannon has the unique experience of having actually created budgets for Wellington. He knows what the town needs to be successful and what it needs to grow. He's had to make those hard decisions and knows what to fight for, and what can be put on hold for greener pastures. Um, he would be the voice of finance on the board as he has the actual experience of running the town with a budget. He wouldn't be speculating on whether the planning division needs an extra person based on the cost of hiring that person, but on the workload of that division, and what the effect of hiring that extra person means to the growth of Wellington. The adult potato is excited about having that actual financial experience of running Wellington's town staff on the board of trustees. Between Ed Cannon, Lowry Moyer, and Rebecca Daly, we have three candidates that cover all the bases of what's needed on the board of trustees. And we're actually excited about what's to come in Wellington. The three have all served on the planning commission and have the experience and education to capitalize on opportunities, create and implement a vision for the town based on feedback from Wellington's residents, and maintain while protecting the small town feel that makes Wellington special. Wellington, good things are coming with these three. All you have to do now is vote for them. Let's make this happen. Thanks for joining us for this special series focusing on the candidates. And don't forget to lock your doors.